the only person who was saying, oh, you should stop messing around with cameras and, you know, get a life and get a real job was, was me. At some point I decided, right, I want this to work, I want this to be my career. But we just were unaware that we had to keep selling. We didn't know that we risked losing, everything. losing clients. Pretty much all of our work came from networking. We go and talk to them as if they were a human being, because they are. It resulted in them lending us a load of camera gear for free. These people may just become friends and that's great. And they may also become useful business contacts and that's also really good. It's very unlikely that you will get very far if you just stay locked up in your room and don't do anything. I do do a countdown. Three, two, one. Ta-da! <laughs> That's I it. Can't. Hello. Hi. Mm. Let's start off with a sip of apple juice. S- sip of apple juice. Yes. Very delicious. Delightful. Right. This is episode two. Take well, two. Are take we not, two. Are we talking about it? No, we're not talking. Well, let's, yeah. Let's just say uh, we had an issue with audio last time, so yeah. we have to do this again. We have. But what you will notice from. Uh, the first episode there's a slight increase in audio quality and we've got a bit of lighting for those of you now who mm-hmm. can't see us right now I've got these big black things in my face yeah no so big mics uh yeah, they're for those listening to audio, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. yeah no so that, that was really exciting purchases um yeah we've managed to upgrade a bit of equipment yeah. and here we are we've got taking it seriously this time yeah well yeah pretty much um my so yeah squeaking can you hear that no He's a good okay, mic, good. remember that. Good. Right. <laughs> okay then, Julian, do you want to kind of introduce yourself then? Well, you know what this podcast is missing? What? Something along the lines of, um, this podcast was brought to you by Squarespace. If you're a professional, <laughs> you'll know that showcasing your... No? No. We, we don't have uh, any sponsors yet. yet. Okay. We'll get one day. All right. Well, maybe. Anyway, introduce yourself, Julian. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell, tell the people who you are. <laughs> Uh, So my name is Julian Wakefield. Um, I am a co-director of and co-founder of Terralon Media. Um, That's pretty much it. Okay, yeah. How much much do you want? I guess, do you want to kind of just say what your general as a director uh, means? Because I guess, as we kind of say, we do a lot of jobs in this industry and you kind of have to take on a lot of roles. Yeah, well... Maybe we should start by telling everyone what Terralon is yeah, and on. does, because um, we didn't really do that in the last last podcast. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Terralon Media is a visual content production company with a heavy emphasis on uh, strategy and social media um, behind it. So that means in practice, we not only do we create video, photo, um, and any visual content. So that includes animation and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but we also do all of the marketing strategy, social media strategy, and we also manage clients' social media accounts yep. so that we're not just you know, making abstract content that their audience might not like, might, might like, might not like. Um, and we're not just dumping all the content on our client's lap and letting them post it and get on with it even though we can let them do that if they want that yes in theory yes um, <laughs> well, of course. um i mean some larger clients they have their in-house marketing teams and they'll know exactly what they want to produce and we'll just yeah. do all the camera and editing work and some other clients they come to us and say hey i've got this service or product and i want to promote this uh how do i do it and so we'll um deliver a start to finish service so we'll Look at what their their offering is, what their message is, what their tone of voice is, who their audience is, that kind of stuff, and deliver a full full service content marketing bundle. And that goes with quite a range of clients, really, you'd say. Yeah, I mean we've got we've got clients ranging from the small uh, artisanal um, That's business. Yeah, I know words. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the way to uh, huge global corporate companies. Um, yeah, just 
Yeah, so you kind of really, yeah. yeah, you you do I think and kind of fit. Yeah, we all love all our clients, <laughs> of course, and they're all equally as important to us. Absolutely, that leads to you then, basically. Yeah, what's your part in the company then? So, whereas before it was pretty much just Guy and I, and we were essentially two freelancers working together, uh, filming, editing, doing everything, basically. Um, that's going to get really annoying. <laughs> um, I need to just pushing the microwave, microphone away from my face every five minutes. <laughs> um, now it's kind of, uh, our roles have moved on more towards, uh, well, I seem to be doing a lot more producing and directing these days. Yep. Um, and less so of the shooting myself, although I still do a fair amount of it, which yep. is great because I do enjoy it. Yep. So... But it's yeah, it's just become that you've become you've started managing a lot more projects. Yeah. Recently. Yeah. I mean I think that's the nature of you know, when you grow as a company, you're uh you have to find someone to run the company and that's you. delegation is key. Yeah. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Because obviously you you really enjoy the filmmaking and photo part of it. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as something you always want to be dipping into a little bit or like basically yeah in the future as the company grows like how much do you want to be involved with the actual like making in the production yeah, yeah. is this something yeah. you've really thought yeah. about uh, it's it's a tricky question I, ideally um i'd say uh, i'd oversee most of them mm-hmm. but we'd have a team who we can trust and who can manage the bulk of the work um, but I still do, you know, I, I still do want to be involved in the actual production of, of things, um, because it's fun. I mean, it's the, the artistic side of it. Yeah. That's, that's the, you know, otherwise it just turns into a desk job, I guess. Okay. Fair enough. Nice. So, okay. Let's, let's, let's go a bit back in time then. Um, start from the beginning. What, what was like the first real thing that got you into photography, filmmaking, so how did I get into it? Yeah. Um, so I used to, we're going to cover all of this again. Huh? We are. We're going to do it all again, Julian. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I'm sure there'll be some details that, you know, that you might remember once again yeah. that we didn't before. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I used to paint portraits yep. and uh, I did that to help fund university or fund the fun part of university. Yeah. Um, a bit of extra cash on the side. Yep. And um, I painted from photographs. And when people kept sending me blurry, dark photos, I was like, I can't paint you if I can't see you. Yeah. So I got into photography um, and kind of segued into video because I bought a Canon 500D, yep. uh, which could film as well. I think it was maybe just 720p. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I filmed myself painting and I made silly YouTube videos yeah. um, and to kind of promote my paintings and yeah and I did that throughout university uh, and it, it, in university I knew I wanted to work in kind of PR or marketing so then when I graduated I was job hunting and um, I did a few photos and videos for the local pub to get some pocket money. I guess it never it kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the pub thing, because I remember Julian, uh, not Julian, Guy, sorry, he said that that was one of your first clients mm-hmm. that you brought to Terralon. Was When you did that video, was that as you as an individual or was that as part of Terralon, do you remember? I don't know if Terralon was, I don't know if we'd founded Terralon yet. No, so you weren't working as a partner with Guy? Uh, you don't know <laughs> maybe I mean I met Guy at university and when we were at uni um, he was helping me make a few of the painting videos and yep. we were kind of just messing around and well at least I was he, 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 he uh, had started doing a few freelance jobs um, uh, filmmaking freelance jobs uh, but yeah we we were just as far as it, as far as the videos we made for me it was just a lot of fun. A lot of fun to um, make. Yeah, and then after that, I was I went back to my down to my dad's 
in London and the guy went back to Cambridge to his parents, but he was always traveling to and from London for odd yeah. freelance jobs. So he was around and filming stuff and, um, you know, we'd talk about it, uh, I guess, I can't remember, but maybe we'd sort of share opinions on stuff that we were doing. Okay. And, um, but as time went by, we would, um, we kind of worked together a bit more and more. Okay. So it just kind of naturally happened and you were like, right, why don't we just do this together as a team? Yeah. We, I mean, we'd kind of collaborated on, on my painting videos. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> I suggested that we start up Terlon together. Okay. So it was your idea. You're going to take credit. Well, no, the guy said it was my idea as well. <laughs> I can't remember, I can't remember. In his podcast. Did he? I think so. I don't think he specified. Well, I think I maybe suggested it. I'm pretty sure You I can did. take credit, Julian, it's but, fine. Well, no, I'm not going to take credit. <laughs> if, if, but, <laughs> it's all me. It's all me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, us, um, one of us did, and you can put like a, on the video, you can put like the answer. Okay. Was it Julian? Once, Was it Guy? Once you guys discuss we'll, we'll the true answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were both filming either side. I think, I think the pub videos were before it was Terlon. Okay. Are those your first kind of real, yeah. You say well, no, cause it was on the Terlon, it was on the Terlon Vimeo account. Yeah. So, so it must've been after. So did you any do any jobs for yourself before then? I don't know. You don't know. I think so. Well, at, at university, yeah. I was I was um, also interning for a um, uh, a marketing agency yep. called Boost Boost Agency, and I would do photography jobs um, and creative direction and even a bit of film directing. Yeah, I remember this this. Uh, this poor guy who'd been working for this company or freelancing for this company for who knows how many years yeah. and was you know minding his own business doing his job perfectly well and all of a sudden this like student comes in and starts telling him what to film and what to do and i had no idea i mean yeah. i had really silly suggestions like hey let's make a it was a property video and like, oh, let's make a, a stop motion of the pillow on the sofa <laughs> rolling around the flat and then you can show off the entire flat. And it was, it, you know, no, it didn't I work. mean, <laughs> I mean that's the actually video like was fine, but we spent like an hour on this stop motion. Yeah, which I can just, imagine that can take quite a while. It just looks silly. <laughs> imagine like this pillow floating around the flat. It sounds like quite an interesting idea though, anyway. Mm. <laughs> but yeah the, the point was is that you're saying you you kind of i don't know you basically had picked up a camera you'd taken a couple of photos a couple of videos that you've made of a guy and because you had a camera they were just like oh yeah do you want to have a go at this or did you suggest can i try do photos and video for you guys at the boost agency boost yeah. agency the way that came about was um the ceo of that company came to lecture in one of my social media modules at university. Okay. And he was, he'd come to talk about social media. And at the end of that, I went up to him and said, Hey, I really enjoyed that. Um, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Um, yep. I don't really remember what else I said to him, but you know, <laughs> Good bit it, of chat. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I went and have a chat with him and it started up a relationship and then, yeah. Nice. Went from there. That's interesting. Cause how was um, learning about like social media at university? Because to me, the idea of like learning it at school at university is um, I don't know the fact because it's something that's constantly evolving, mm -hmm. and the idea that if you know it takes quite a while to put something into a module or create some a course for university mm -hmm. to get that set up, and probably once by the time it usually actually comes to the students, it's probably out of date. What, what was it like at uni actually learning about it? If you think about it, social media is um, word of mouth. On a large scale. On a larger scale. Yeah. Yeah. So social interaction has been around for forever. Uh, social media has just changed the way people get their message across and changed the, the number of people you can reach. 
Um, and it wasn't necessarily looking at social media uh, at the fine details of it. It was more like macro social okay. media. So for example, you can say that we've gone from a society of mass consumption of media yep. to, to a society of mass production of media where before the owners of the means of production were few and now everyone is um, an yeah, owner of yeah. the means of production because everyone's creating content for social media. Everyone has a phone. Yeah. And so if you take that and look at the implications that that has on you know, everyday life, it's incredibly interesting. So it was, it was looking at things like that and not so much at things like you know, how, how many followers does this person have and how do you trick the algorithms of yep. this social media to get more followers or whatever. Okay. Um, and I mean, you know, there, we, we did look a little bit at, at, at how businesses use social media, but those were the kind of early days, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was the early days of Instagram. Yeah, Facebook sure. had been a, a while from around for a while. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting. How useful would you say you found it? Was it just mainly like general ideas that kind of have helped you a bit? The transferable skills were very useful and giving us the foundations and the general ideas that you could then apply to, you know, how things are evolving now. Yeah. Those were very useful. Um, certainly in, in our in my job today, it was very useful in well, in all of the social media strategy side of what we do. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. But actually, yeah, you're saying that you went straight from this marketing internship. Mm -hmm. um, then you left uni and you went straight into doing video. No, uh, kind of, sort of. No. Remember, I was trying to look for a job in marketing. Yeah. So I did a few internships and a few, you know, small one-off jobs, um, temping. Well, not, not that that much of it but you know I, I did a few things here and there video and photo jobs were few and far between at that time um oh what to try and work for an actual company to do photo and video yeah. is that what you're thinking well okay so when i graduated the first thing i did is i went i went to france which is where i grew up so yeah. i went back and lived there for a while to spend let's say an extended summer right. which lasted you know, into sort of, sort of mid-October time. So right, you finish uni, you can have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, spent it, I spent that time painting uh, okay. because I wanted to, you know, I got really into it uni. I really enjoyed it. I never really wanted to do it as a career because, because of reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because the cliche of the starving artist is, yeah. is, true to a certain extent it's like if you're trying to make it in in music you have to be extremely talented or extremely lucky to make it big and so there was that which i i considered that and um and also it was a hobby and i didn't really want to be forced to do it or have to do it because then that changes the nature of it that changes the relationship of um yeah how yeah. you look at it yeah. i guess yeah so Anyway, so I went, I went to France because I, right, I've got, I want to take some time off to get this out of my system. And what, painting? Yeah. And going out? Painting. <laughs> or just painting? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and I really did. Like, I, I painted so, so much that summer. I was, nice. you know, I can't remember how many paintings I did, but probably something like close to 90. Wow. Okay. But I mean, some of them were the larger ones, which were on big six foot to eight foot tall canvases. I didn't do that many of. Okay. Yeah. But then I did a whole bunch on on uh, card and other stuff. I you know I take old things that I'd find in the street, like I don't know an, an old street sign that had been um, broken off or something. Yeah, a broken street sign or something. I paint something on that. That's and cool. then I would um, put on my social media and say, hey, I've painted this. Uh, I'm going to be walking around uh, Bordeaux tonight. Yeah. And I had this app that would broadcast my location. 
and right. I said the first person to find me uh, wins this painting. <laughs> and then I and then uh, you know there were uh, I don't know anywhere between five and ten people looking for me, <laughs> and I just and I could see them on my app, <laughs> and so I just run away and and, and like you know. <laughs> Um, not run away, but I'd <laughs> yeah, just get on a tram and see if they could find me and just play play around for an evening. Oh, that's hilarious! Um, yeah, so I spent a summer doing that. So um, you're just having a bit of a laugh with it. Yeah, it was. You know, as I said, it was. It was. I was experimenting with social media basically, yeah. because I really enjoyed trying to um, set up a you know business air quotes okay. um, around my painting stuff in your work yeah. yeah and I knew I didn't want to use it have it as a job but I enjoyed the thrill of you know setting up a website thinking about how to promote myself um, and how to increase follower count things like that it was fun did you set up a website for the paint painting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's no longer active um, the URL just points to the Facebook page now okay so it's julianwakefield.com if you want to uh, have a look yeah, but I doubt yeah. you'll have time to make a painting for anyone who they want it. No, I don't. I haven't. I haven't really painted no. since that summer. No, really. So I really got it out of my system. Was that was that, was that the idea well, at the time? You thought I'm going to get this out of my system? Or is no, that I didn't want to after? do so much of it that I was sick of it, and that's not really what happened. Um, I think I, I have done a few since then, but not many. Maybe like three, four max. Okay. The reason why I don't do that anymore is. Well, first, I don't have much time anymore. Yeah. Um, and also, filmmaking and photography is artistic enough, so that's my you know, artistic new, output, yeah. and it's my, yeah, my new thing. New new I thing. do eventually want to get back into it. Yeah. I um, think when you retire, you'll start painting again, just when you have fun. Maybe not. I don't know. I went into some before. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you do any personal projects ever, really, now nowadays? Or is that something of, like, the past? Film and photo Yeah, film and photo. Uh, I do a lot of personal photography. Yeah. So when I'm going on holiday or when, you know, family Christmases and things like that, I'll take photos. Yeah. Uh, film takes more time. It takes a little bit more time because you have to, you know, go through the editing and all that kind of stuff. So um, occasionally I'll do like travel videos. Little bits. But I don't really put those online. I keep them for myself. Nice. Because, you know, I'm not interested in making a travel video with no storyline yep. full of zoom zoom transitions my and year 2019 <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i mean you know some of the, some of the people do that uh make some really good content and they're really yep. you know don't want to completely diss them but it's um, not the vibe you're going for basically it's not my thing i just, you know the, <laughs> my, the personal videos i make I, I keep them for myself because it's fun to watch five ten years later it's Absolutely. like oh yeah those you know those yeah. were the days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I get that. Yeah. And uh, I have a similar kind of, yeah. even though I do share quite a bit of them. Mm. I've still got lots to edit of my uh, travels. Um, but anyway. Um, you're, you're a constant Vietnam. My constant and, Vietnam. And, yeah. yeah, I'm still in Vietnam if you uh, look at my Instagram. <laughs> 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 no, I'm here. Anyway, yeah. so you, you did that. You did that summer and then you came back to the UK, right? To live with your dad. The, uh, yes. Yeah. So I came back. I don't know, October, November uh, of that year, once my summer had ended. And, and you were applying to jobs and doing interviews for marketing yes. and PR jobs. Yes. And at what point did you realize this this isn't for me then? It was more of a gradual thing. Okay. I mean, I was job hunting and then I was, you know, doing more and more video and photo work. Okay. And I think what really... Yeah, there kind of was a, a, a breaking point where I'd applied to this uh, postgraduate scheme with Procter & Gamble. Okay. And um, they made you fill out these online forms. So, you know, there's a load of questions and each question you had to write, I don't know, 100 words. And then there were a few like mini essays that you had to write. And this then, is just for an interview, is it? Yeah, it was yeah. just the first part yeah, yeah, yeah. of the of the um, enrollment process or the the application process, and then there was you had to like upload your CV, a PDF, and then you ha next page you had to uh, write out your CV. Um, so yeah. it was like, well, I've just uploaded it. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. extremely frustrating. I, I'm sure a lot of people have that experience, um, and it was not like you could just copy and paste it because it's all in different boxes. 
Basically, it was a nightmare to fill out. Yeah, it was a nightmare. And then I had to do a phone interview uh, after I got through that stage. And then once I passed the phone interview, I had to do a Skype interview. And once I passed that stage, I had to go in for an assessment day where they give you all kinds of tests in person, um, like logic tests, math tests, all that kind of stuff. And then I had to go back in for, um, I think it was like an interview with a panel Basically, loads and, and then, loads of steps. Yeah. yeah. And then another interview. And anyway, got back down to about two of us. And then they turned around and said, right, well, we've made a, a decision. This year, we're taking no one. So I was like, well, what was the oh point of all of that? I mean, goodness. So at that point, I was like, Surely right, <laughs> I'm fed up, of, uh, <laughs> fed up of applying for jobs. This is um, ridiculous. And is that so, when you kind of saw Guy doing his thing and you're like, I'm going to have a crack at that? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, kind of. Memory's a bit hazy because this was like quite a while ago now. Guy was coming down to London every so often yeah. to... Jobs. Um, yeah, because he had freelance jobs. And and I was doing like the small jobs around, I guess, uh, some photo and video jobs. This is just three people you kind of knew. Really? Or had you approached them? Yeah, no, I, I, I can't remember. Maybe I approached a couple, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, I wasn't yet in that mindset that yeah. that this was going to be my career. So I, had, sure. it, I didn't yet have that motivation that I wanted to go and do that. So I wouldn't, you know, I hadn't yet yeah, decided w- to actively go out and pursue clients. Yeah. Sure. Probably shortly after that Procter & Gamble thing happened, I decided, right, this is, I'm fed up of, of job hunting. So I'm going to do something else. And so I think that was when I suggested that we start Terralon, or maybe Guy suggested yeah. it. And how we'll find how out. serious were you in that mindset of like, right, let's let's go for it, uh, doing this video thing when you when you decided that? I was serious, as in I knew it was. I wanted to treat it as a job. Okay. I didn't know if it would become a career. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't necessarily think okay we're going to have like a full-on company that's going to be successful I um, I was more in the mindset of you know we're both doing the same thing why don't we team up um, because uh, it just looks better if you're a company rather than just you know a freelancer, a freelancer on your own and that was very from the start we've always wanted to have that company image yep. for many reasons one because you look a bit more legit and two because it's scalable so yep. if if you're a freelancer or if you're known as like two artists um then you face the issue of people hire you as a person and they pay you for your time uh so if you're on another job already or you're already booked that day, you say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come. Yeah. Whereas if you're a company and they say, hey, can you, um, uh, can you come film this for me? You can just say, yeah, sure, we'll send one of our guys. Yeah. And, you know, they're hiring Terralon, not just you as a person. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. That you makes can scale it. sense. Yeah. When you made that decision, like, what was people's general opinions on uh, what were you doing were a lot of people like Julian wh- what are you doing you, you should be looking for a job instead of having a bit of fun with photo and video or like did you get a lot of mixed opinions no uh, I didn't get any opinions I mean well I got supportive opinions from from parents and, and, and family yeah um, the only the only person who was saying oh you should stop messing around with cameras and you know, get a life and get a real job was, was me. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because, you know, it was, it was fun. And, and that's what I did as a hobby. And, and then people started paying me for it. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, I just, I saw all my friends, you know, doing like, Serious jobs. Doing serious. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, not serious jobs. No, serious you, you jobs. Know I mean. Or, you know, the traditional jobs where yeah. you go and get hired by someone else and you have a paycheck and, and a salary and all that kind of stuff. Um, and responsibilities yeah. or constraints. Um, I mean, we had responsibilities to a certain extent, but 
it was it's we different. were very free so it felt talents. like we were very free because we so were doing our own things and we didn't have to go in to work at a certain time and we it was kind of like still being at uni because there were periods when you didn't have a job and you just you messed around did nothing just when went you out probably a sh- lot. should have been a uh, approaching people but <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you Santi. <laughs> um so yeah there were times like that and then there were times when we had a job and we had a deadline and and okay. you know it was like exam time at uni at what point did that change then that mindset because clearly you, you're saying you know you, you did have a, you know you're just out of uni you're still young you're having fun you're making photos and you're living with your parents so you probably got pretty low costs do you mm-hmm. think that's why you had that mindset at the time again it was more of a gradual thing it wasn't like all of a sudden click yeah right this is a job um i was living at my dad's and i saw because i couldn't afford anywhere else and i saw all of my peers uh and friends and um everyone else kind of going and getting normal jobs and Puppets. having a salary and, aff- and could afford a flat in london and yeah. could afford to go out and that kind of stuff or you know, it, it was tough the first few years because you can't afford all of that. You're, you know, you have to live at your parents. You, any money we were making, we were reinvesting in cameras and lenses and all that kind of stuff. When I say it was like still being at uni, yeah. it was like still being at uni, but all of your friends were no longer at uni. Okay. <laughs> you still managed to go out a little bit now and then, but um, there were definitely sacrifices that were made. Yeah. And then more and more I was kind of fed up of living at my dad's and at first it was like okay well um, you know sometimes it would take take a toll on me or us because I'm I I know that guy felt that as well Um, is that you're making all these sacrifices and you're like okay well to what end what are these sacrifices for what am I trying to build here Um, and I think, you know, after a, a year of doing it, you, you kind of start thinking, well, I don't want all of this to have been for for nothing. I want this to turn into a proper career and I want this to be useful. I want this to be a thing. Yeah. Um, so, or, you know, that was the first stage of, of it being a... A, taking it seriously and yeah you start job. getting frustrated not yeah. doing much you know and, and then you're like i really want to be able to be self-sufficient i want to you know move out of my dad's and that kind of stuff and so you used to take it more seriously because you have these these goals in your mind and then i guess when i did move out of my dad's i was like okay well now i'm self-sufficient and this is a, an actual job that means i can i can provide for myself and i don't have to depend on someone else that and must that have been yeah, it must have been quite a big step. Yeah, I mean, it felt really, really good because the first couple of years, as I said, it was it was difficult seeing everyone else um, having a normal lifestyle and, you know, living on their own. And everyone would say, oh, you know, if I could still live with my parents, I would. It's great. They cook food for you and everything. And yeah, it's, it's you know, that's really good. That's some benefits. And there are loads yeah. of benefits, um, especially at my dad's because... Yeah. you know he's a nice guy um <laughs> and also it's you know you it's it's a house in london as well yeah yeah, yeah I, you know location. well it, it was it it's wasn't central london it's 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 out in twickenham so um there is a bit of a journey into london and i was certainly yeah uh out of all my friends one of the people who lived the furthest out so i spent a lot of time on trains and night buses and all that kind of stuff but, but still still very lucky to have that yeah uh, yeah. yeah so al- along with all, all of the you know regular sacrifices that you have uh living at your parents i'm making it sound like it's awful it wasn't that bad it no was really but you good. get that you know but you're yeah, comparing yourself yeah. to other people um and the, you're starting to think I, I need to yeah at some point the main thing for me was where am i going what yeah. am i doing here am i wasting my time is someone going to you know if this doesn't work is someone going to look at my cv and think well you spent like five six years basically living your dad's fucking around with cameras no. <laughs> swear, but, um, you're getting passionate <laughs> it's good well yeah <laughs> um and i didn't i didn't want to end up in that scenario one point of view could be that the more time went by the more time i'd wasted messing around with cameras um 
or you could say the more time went by, uh, the older I was getting before I would start my real career or whatever. So I didn't want that time to be wasted time. So, I, you know, at some point I decided, right, I want this to work. I want this to be my career. And certainly when I m was able to move out of my dad's, I was like, right, now I feel like I've been able to get to a point where I'm self-sufficient and where I've kind of caught up with my friends who had got, you know, normal jobs after university and who could afford a flat in, yeah. in London. Um, and that was a really, really nice moment because not only was I self-sufficient or were we self-sufficient, but we also got there from scratch. Um, you yeah. know, we, we didn't have, but what yourself. we didn't have initial investment. We didn't have any, anyone telling us how to do things. Um, we didn't learn how to use cameras at school or at uni. Um, I mean, we did have a lot of support from our parents, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, but it was all through trial and error. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah. Was so so was, it, was it a comfortable, like, did you save up a certain amount of money to know? Because obviously freelancing is not um, a regular income. It's, mm -hmm. So did you have like a certain amount of money saved away? Like how, how comfortable was that? Was it a jump basically mm. to do it? You mean how? When you had to move out. How much of a leap of faith was yes, it to commit to rent yeah, for a year? That's, or, my, that's yeah. my question. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, I I did save up, a, you know, a, a enough for maybe three months' rent or possibly four months' rent, um, but that would cover rent and not food and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can't. I think we just saved up a bit. We were feeling a bit more optimistic about. Was it? But was it? Was it? Yeah. Was it a comfortable decision though, or, or was it like, yeah, okay, like this is. I think it's just the right time. It feels I was right. nervous about it. Yeah, that's that's. I what mean, I, I also to. got a flat that. Well, three months after moving in, I could move out. It wasn't like I was fixed okay. into the flat for a year or two years. Okay, I had to right stay then. in the flat for three months. After that, I could move out if I found someone to move into the room that, you know, I just had to find a replacement. Yeah. So. So you kind of had a safety net, but I assume like once you made that jump. And, you know, as you say, it felt really nice and like, OK, I, I'm, I'm now I'm now managing to support some sort of lifestyle. I, I bet you were like, right, let's let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> if I would had to like move back into my dad's after that, it would have taken a toll on on morale. Did, did you notice a change in your working attitude at that point when you moved out? E mm. Not really. No. A little bit. Well, no, the change in my attitude happened before because, and if you've listened to Guy's podcast, you'll know this. At one point, we had a moment where we kind of lost a couple of big clients because they had budget cuts and um, and things weren't looking very rosy for us. So, so that was a bit of a before panic you mode. moved out, was yeah, it? Yeah, it was before oh, okay. I moved out. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, Guy had already moved out. Yeah. So he was like even more in panic mode yeah. when that happened. What happened is we set up the company. We did a huge marketing push. We would sell, 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 or we would, you know, network and go out and look for clients. And then we get all the work and we get a few clients who would like come back to us. And then we do all that work and we keep doing all that work, but we stopped going out and selling because we were too busy doing that work. Yeah. So it comes in cycles, you know, you spend a year setting up and going out and selling and doing all that and then you're good for a year and a half and or maybe a bit more but whatever um you're good for a year and a half and you've got a lot of work but after that year and a half runs out because you've stopped pushing those sales during that time that year and a half where you're working it can dry up and it takes time. There's a delay between the first contact with a potential client that you're trying to sell to yep. and the time when they actually hire you. So it's not like, oh, we're working for a year and a half and then we lose some clients and, oh, it's okay, we'll just go sell and get some more work next week. It's yep. not like that. I mean, you have to spend time contacting new people and um, you know, developing a relationship before they can trust you enough to give you uh, some work or at least a, a job that's... Um, large enough to be of consequence yeah i think as we said on guy's podcast at that point what you probably should have done is hired an editor 
to free up time to be able to approach new clients. Uh, would, you, would you agree? Is that something maybe you if have we done? had more work? The volume of work we had at that time was not enough to warrant hiring someone else. Yet. Even even part time for certain jobs. Maybe what we should have done is be is we should have been less lazy, and okay. in the time we had off, we shouldn't have just you know been happy or comfortable or the complacent. victim of our yeah complacent um, this, we this should, is easy yeah, yeah 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 and our work ethic definitely has developed uh, and grown uh, or yep. evolved as we go along it's not like we were lazy um, but we just were unaware that we had to keep selling and we had to keep doing these things because it was like oh, okay we've got work this is how it is that's great um, we didn't know that we risked Losing everything. Losing clients. Very kind of quickly. Stuff. Yeah. So that was a mistake we made. <laughs> and we learned from it. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Especially at like the beginning when you didn't have many clients, what was your kind of main way to gain them and also build relationships and so on? Networking. 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 Nice. I whisper it because it's a secret. Is it? Yeah. No, 100% networking. Yeah. Very, very few of our work has come from anything else cold calling and all that or putting your stuff out there on, on social media and hoping it just doesn't work um, I mean social media and your website and all that is useful as a storefront or not even it's useful as a, a portfolio that will seal the deal because if people are interested then they'll come on your website to check you out Unless if it looks you have a specific funnel, which is what we're looking yes, into. Yes, but we didn't do that at first. No. <laughs> um, and even so, if you have a funnel, it's not the website that attracts them. It's whatever it's a small the part start of, it, yeah. of your funnel is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, pretty much all of our work came from networking. You know, one of our largest um, clients in the first couple of years came about because my neighbor knew a guy who was friends with a person who knew someone right. at <laughs> the marketing uh, in the marketing department of uh, of Queen Mary University of London, which was the the, the client. Yeah. So. Yeah. So networking. networking. Do you want to go in a bit more in depth of? how you go about doing networking then ah do you want to hear some of the uh nuggets of wisdom and the examples yeah, that I we gave hear. in the last time yeah. we recorded uh, this yeah i want to i want to hear julian's secrets of networking go okay on. um <laughs> which one should we start with there was so, the one like so you know um trying to first build those relationships um you know you're looking for a client you yeah, at the moment you don't maybe have a few or you're looking to get into a certain industry. Mm -hmm. How would you go about that? Well, if you're starting off blank, you kind of need to build a portfolio. Sure. You can go and do a few things with your mates and that kind of stuff. But the better option is, well, option number one is look or figure out what industries you want to target. Like ideally, who would you be working for if you had clients? And then look at what they're doing and try and go shoot some stuff that's similar to that. Yeah. because you may not be groundbreaking or you may not be coming up with new innovative ideas, but at least you're getting practice in and that's what matters when you're starting out. Option number two is you actually approach someone and you say, um, I mean, you probably can't do this with some very big people if you're yeah. starting, um, but you can approach someone, whoever it is, and you say, hey, um, I would like to... Uh, make a video for you or yeah. take some photographs for you and they're going to be like okay well who are you why would we hire you and how much is it going to cost and you say well I've not really done this before you know be honest be open you know, th this is what I have done if you have some stuff that you've done so you probably before. should have something yeah at least a couple this. of photos like go and some do some stuff with your like you know yeah, yeah. I mean if you're at the point where you're going and looking for work you've probably already taken a photo or filmed something you'd hope so wouldn't you yeah <laughs> so you can say hey this is what i've done this is what i can do uh, i'm just starting out but um here's the deal i will eliminate the risk that you are taking by hiring me and promising to pay me money by saying 
you only have to pay me if you like it. If you like it and you want to use it, then you can pay me and we will agree a price before we start. Okay. Um, and if you don't like it, then you don't have to, you don't have to pay for it. Uh, you don't get to use it. Um, but I can use it for my portfolio. And that means that you have some stuff for your portfolio. They will also have given you a brief to start. Uh, so you'll have practice Experience. working with a client to a brief. Um, and hopefully if you don't do a terrible job, they'll pay you. Maybe, hopefully. I think that's a really good bit of advice. And something when you first told me, I was like, that makes so much sense. Yeah. And especially if you've, you know, you've done a couple of pieces, it's something that can easily break you into working with a natural client and not necessarily having to do it for free, mm -hmm. even though there might be, when, when would you say is the right time to do work for free? When we agree to take on a job, there are three factors that influence our decision. The first is, you know, the standard, um, how much are we going to earn from it? It's the, yeah. the economic value. The second is, is it something that is going to enhance our portfolio? And the third is, will we learn something from it? And, you know, that is a pretty important one, especially sure. if you're starting out. Well, all of them are important, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> And as long as the sum of all three of those things go over a certain threshold, then you should do it. So if they're paying nothing, but you're going to learn a huge amount of really valuable stuff and it's going to be really, really good for your portfolio and it's going to lead to loads of amazing opportunities and you enjoy it, um, and you enjoy it then that's great. Um, if it if you're not going to learn anything from it, but it pays well and it's decent for your portfolio, then do it. You know, just balance, just balance those three those, things. Yeah, um, it comes through experience of like learning what those are. Because I think the other part of mm -hmm. it, it's okay. You got, it's okay to make mistakes because that's how you learn what that balance is. Yeah, we've made a load of mistakes. Um, I think as any business has. Yeah. It's growing. Yeah, but we've always taken those mistakes on and learned from them. Yeah. So even a mistake is something that can teach you something. Very wise, Julian. Words Very of wise. wisdom. I know, right? I'm on fire tonight. <laughs> He's proud of himself. It's the apple juice. It's the apple juice. There you go. So there you go. That's how you kind of build a portfolio. You build a bit of a portfolio. You're, you're happy with it. You think it's strong. Um, and you've got a bit of work towards the kind of clients that you want to aim at. For example, sports or whatever. Now we get on to the networking <laughs> side of things. Yeah. Where do you go from there? You know, you want, you want to start building a greater amount of clients or whatever. What um, well, the obvious thing with networking is talk to your current contacts, as in, yep. you know, your friends, your friends, friends, your friends, 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 yep. and so forth and so on. Just let people know. Yeah. It can be done easily by social media or just by chat. You know, that just happens with conversation. And yep. Yep. There's loads of ways to leverage social media and social networks to yeah. network. <laughs> um, but if you are really struggling, one thing you can do um, is you can go to, uh, once you've figured out the industries you want to target, go to trade shows that that industry yeah. organizes. So in the film industry, we have things like NAB, BSC, BVE. Well, we used to have BV. Um, yeah, things like that. But a lot of different industries have events like that that the public are invited to. And um, you know anyone who is a big or medium deal in the industry will have a stand there. So you can go there, go and talk to a few people. And it's important when you first approach them as you don't just walk up to them and say, hey, I want to sell you my services. Sure. Go and talk to them as if they were a human being because they are, um, you know, say hello, ask them about them, talk about what's on their stand and that kind of stuff. Especially if, you know, you're trying to target a specific industry, you'd think you'd have at least some sort of interest. Yes in yeah. that industry so yeah. that's probably one of the best things to connect with these kind of people you'd think yeah and if you have an interest in that industry then you'll have interesting things to talk about yeah and you know you if it's something that you enjoy which hopefully it is then you will 
have or you know you'll enjoy the conversation and build more real connections mm -hmm. to get to the point go and talk to them and then um and then say oh hey by the way how do you manage your marketing or who makes your content or you know it, through conversation they might even ask you oh what do you do where are you from and you say oh i just happen to be a filmmaker you know? that's that's the best case and then scenario. yeah <laughs> and at some point you may express you say hey i'd be you know this was nice um I like your company, I like what your products, I like what you do. I'd love to, you know, maybe talk about helping you guys out with some video or photo content. Um, who should I talk to to um, make that happen? If their marketing manager or whoever's in charge is on their stand, then you can go and talk to them then and there. If they're not, get their email. And then this is the important part. Remember the name and, you know, job title or remember the details of the person that you spoke to because then when you go and email the marketing manager or their, their boss whatever you can start your email by saying hi i am santi or i am you know whoever oh, yeah. paul recommended that i email you and all of a sudden you're not really cold calling or cold emailing them yeah. out of nowhere you are emailing them you know quote unquote on recommended on recommendation of paul or whoever this person is, yeah. Stand, yeah. And that's really important because, you know, they know Paul and they think, okay, well, Paul must have recommended him to us for a reason. So I'll at least acknowledge his email and I'll at least look into it. No, it's not just a random, it's email, not just a random email out of nowhere that, that could be, you know, someone spamming you. You're, yeah. You know, it, you kind of piggyback off of the... Uh, they're, they're in relationship. Yeah, basically. you piggyback off of, off of Paul's legitimacy. And let's hope Paul has legitimacy. <laughs> As you say, you were self-taught and everything that you did. Um, what was yeah the main ways that you learned everything, basically? Well, that's a very broad question. It's a very broad question. Um, okay, let's go with filmmaking. Filmmaking. Well, I learned about you know the basics, things like aperture and shutter speed and all that kind of stuff um, for photography when I was you know, around just before and after university when I had picked up a camera and some friends like get, told, taught me the basics. Uh, then it was a bit of experimentation throughout university. Um, and I made some terrible, terrible videos. <laughs> then a bit through Guy because, yeah. you know, he'd started freelancing and he'd read a few blogs and watched YouTube videos and all that. Yeah, that must have been really helpful just having someone to bounce ideas off and just kind of grow together really and having a mate yeah doing it with yeah, you yeah. we have always learned a lot from each other yeah. um and then yeah after that it was more youtube videos uh i remember we in the early days we would um we we would sit and watch staff pics on vimeo for yeah. hours and hours and kind of think, oh, how did you do that? How did they do that? Where was the camera here? So those... And try and work it out. As you're saying, it's, it's like kind of... So do you want to explain what staff picks? Yeah, they're like a curated feed of recommended videos. But the difference is, it's like, as we've, we've had this discussion before, is like the way I kind of got into filmmaking photo video is definitely more around the kind of social media surge through kind of people like Sam Calder mm -hmm. and all that kind of travel industry of youtube and instagram whereas yeah. when you started you didn't really have that whole world really i'm not that old no <laughs> no social um, media is very young yeah i mean yeah they they, they weren't Let's so prevalent your, they were yeah your inspiration was, was very different yeah those those kind of videos were kind of starting maybe the early days yeah. yeah but i was watching you know i had no interest in making travel videos or that kind of stuff i watched super bowl ads and i yeah. still do every year i just love sitting down watching all the super bowl ads because you know to me those are those are really fun you know they're, they're funny they're engaging there's a lot of um, a lot of money poured into them, so uh, production value is is quite high. Often, what I'm trying to say is that like what you would spend your time, all the videos you used to watch, are more kind of commercial. Yep. Videos yep. and little bits like that. Yeah, because I knew, you know, at, at that time I decided right, I want this to be a job. I want to make videos like that that. Yeah. that sell to other people, and it's always been, you know, I, I have 
n I don't have as much interest in filming narrative pieces as I do in making commercial videos and ads and things like that because you can write a story and make a nice narrative piece and uh, you know that's one kind of skill set yeah. but for me the challenge of taking a business need and making something that's interesting artistic and engaging out of something that essentially is just someone trying to sell something to someone else basically using that to solve that problem yeah yeah that solving means. that that problem is is kind of what i really get a kick out of as you said because it gives you a well i mean obviously different people have different opinions but when i think of filming a narrative piece there's no challenge or there there are many challenges to it <laughs> but but those challenges don't interest me sure. the challenge that interests me is not just okay i want to write this story and film it the challenge that interests me is i want to make something that feels like a story but that also meets a business need and that those business needs are a constraint that you have to kind of work around solve and and puzzle. and solve that yeah exactly and meet the client's demand and their multiple multiple <laughs> requests for re-edits and things like that it, you know it's it's always a lot of people think it's a pain in the ass but i really enjoy it i, yeah. I enjoy trying to figure out and to solve those problems as you said it's like you were always interested in to going into marketing and yeah. that kind of thing so yeah. it was mixing those two things together mm -hmm. rather than telling necessarily just an artistic story yeah. yeah exactly so also talking about like people you've learned off um who who would you say are peers that you've learned a lot from like as you've grown because i assume that's quite a big part of learning just through other people as you said you learn through guy yeah, so uh, Guy and I have learned a lot from each other, um, and I suppose you're you're trying to get oh, to Philip. Name drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Philip Bloom, or, or I hate to admit it, <laughs> um, but he yeah he definitely taught us a lot. Well, initially because Guy used to read his blog, and. I may have glanced at an article or two <laughs> by accident. Um, <laughs> uh, but so it was, yeah, it was the early days of Terralon. Um, so in the first year, year, year and a half. And I was, fo I followed Philip's Instagram and Facebook and all that. Yeah. And then I was on holiday in Florida with my mother and I saw that Phil posted something saying he needed a camera assistant for two days and they needed someone local because there was no budget to fly someone out uh, to where he was and because it was in it was also in Florida and they needed someone local because they needed someone who could work in the US legally and so I saw that and I sent an email saying you know I'm not local but I'm here um, and I also have a US passport so I can work legally here and I have some experience in this, this and this um, and I also live um, right next to you in the UK in uh, Richmond and you know before people think that's creepy. He, he he often talks about where he lives in, in, yeah, I um, think in anyway. quite a few of his videos yeah. and stuff. Um, so it's not like I was stalking him so much that I knew where he <laughs> lived. I mean, I did, but no, I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stop digging. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I emailed him and, uh, and they, yeah, he emailed back saying, you know, yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to have you. And uh, went and did two days of, of uh, camera assisting in Key West in Florida. And that's how I met him in person the first time. Uh, after that, I bumped into him again in around London at you know trade shows and and industry yeah. events and things like that. So that kind so. of goes on to the value of networking within your own industry. Then, yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, there's yeah, you c it, the value of networking in your own industry is a you can meet people like that who will teach you a lot. Um, you can also meet people who might give you a job now and then. So, 
you know, I met a lot of the freelancers that we work with. I met at industry events like that. And also you need to meet these people because they will build up an infrastructure of support that you will need to do your job. So for example, if you're on really good terms with a rental house or a, you know, camera uh, dealership or whatever, you know, you can chat to them and they'll give you advice and maybe you can go into their showroom and, and they'll help you out and you, you build that relationship and you talk to them. Or maybe you can get a loan, a, a, a loan or camera off of them when yours in for repair or things like that. Um, it's always really, really useful to know people. You're allowed to Whoever talk about your Kenya vlog was pretty kind of. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, because that's a good example of. Yeah, yeah. So an example of that is Pro AV. So um, I met the guys at Pro AV. Uh, I think at BSC one year. Started talking to Carl. I can't remember exactly what happened, yeah. but it resulted in them lending us uh, a load of camera gear for free. Well, as in we didn't have to pay money. Money. But we did film a behind the scenes of what we thought of the gear and how we use it and how we put it in practice and that kind of stuff and our opinions on it. Um, so, you know, you can do things like that if you meet these people. And that was really useful because on that shoot, while we didn't really have the budget to, to rent any gear, but I still thought it was a project that was worth getting some nice lenses for and things like that. You know, you figure out how to make that happen and one thing one way to make that happen is to leverage your contacts and chat to people and chat to people yeah well yeah i mean it, you know it's i don't know I, I i like to think that i'm a fairly social person i enjoy talking to these people and i, I enjoy you know just having a human connection with people when you were first starting to you know network and go to these events was it you know did it come quite naturally to you just to chat to people was or like the very beginning were you quite nervous to go around and chat like that well it was never a contrived thing it was you know I, I didn't go to these events because I was like oh yeah I'm gonna go and 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 uh leech off of all of these people that no I but still it just was like, more is there anything like nervous just just going to meet people in general because I think some people are just a bit a little bit put themselves out there well when I first started doing it I didn't realize the value of it so I went because I wanted to check out all the cool new cameras at, at BV at the time, I think it was the first one I went to. I was kind of excited and whatever, okay. um, but I wasn't nervous. I mean, at these events, you walk past the stand and quite often they jump out at you and it's like, hey, do you want to have a look at our yeah. lights? So I guess, the, I guess the point is, is that like your intention necessarily at the beginning wasn't necessarily to network. So that, you know, you went there for the events and that kind of ended up naturally happening. And then you met a few people as you did that. And then you're kind of circle grows as you meet more people as they introduce you to more people and do you see that's generally kind of how it yeah happens? okay i'm not saying this to you but i'm saying this to people who might be listening but just don't overthink it just yeah. go and talk to people like meet people and these people may just become friends and that's great and they may also become useful business contacts and that's also really good it's very unlikely that you will get very far if you just stay locked up in your room and don't do anything. I think that's, that's a really good piece of advice, just in general, just in saying not to overthinking it and just go out there and yeah, enjoy mm. an event and just see what comes from it. Because I think a lot of the time, if you put too much pressure on something, it will show and it will show that you're too nervous mm -hmm. and then it's not as natural. If you are someone who, uh, to whom that doesn't come naturally, there are ways around it. Like you can find a business partner who is comfortable with all that kind of stuff um, and who will help you with that. In the same way that you're, you're probably more comfortable with that side of things than guys generally. Maybe. I mean, it's not that guy's shy or anything. No. I think he just doesn't enjoy it as much. He's slightly more um, introverted. But not it's it's not that he, it's tendencies I'd say I'm not calling yeah. him saying he does he's not outgoing or anything like that because he absolutely is I'm not yeah. slating him before guy you start thinking I am <laughs> 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 I don't know I I'm definitely one of those people I, I'm someone I think that can I I can enjoy my alone time and not spend too much time talking to people but I'd say I also have extroverted tendencies that when I do go out I can 
mm-hmm. talk more. And I, I, yeah. I was saying I'm probably more similar to Guy. Yeah, I suppose so. I'm, you know, anyway. I used to be extremely shy when I was a kid because, and I think it's a byproduct of, of I was English and we moved to France and I was different. And so I felt out of place. Sure. Sometimes, you know, not that my childhood was terrible. It was, yeah. Um, um, but it's definitely something that you can practice and that can change throughout your life. I suppose, maybe. I don't know. It's getting getting quite deep. Get very deep. Not 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 a not an expert in in this kind of stuff, but no. But yeah, it's just something that you know. I think you can just try and practice, put yourself out there, and uh, evolve. <laughs> yes. Do you want to kind of talk about maybe some of your favorite projects that you've done maybe like because obviously you've done quite a bit is there any in particular that stand out that you think that you're allowed to talk about that were quite a moment where you thought yeah this is really cool or what about it was cool some projects i enjoy because the end product looked really good but they were pain to film and they were really laborious some of them were really really fun to film uh, but the end product was, I mean, was okay. But, you know, it might have been a random corporate thing that just doesn't have much to it from the start. I'd say a recent one that I really enjoyed and that I'm quite proud sure. to be to have been involved with is filming a documentary on... Um, on Elliot Kipchoge's sub two-hour marathon. It's a big one. With that one, we followed... Elid Kipchoge, who is an amazing Kenyan athlete, just, you know, Google his name. He's like... I mean, if you haven't heard of him. Olympic medalist, world record holder and all that. Um, Very, very good runner. We went back and forth to Kenya all summer to film Elliot in his training camp in preparation for the attempt of running a marathon in under two hours, which is a moment in sport history that is going to go... Crazy achievement. Yeah. It's madness. It was really fun going back and forth to Kenya and also... We were in Vienna to film the attempt. Really, really cool part of piece of history, really, to be part of. Yeah, um, so we're crazy. all quite proud to have been involved with that. How many times did you go to Kenya? We went there to film him for other things as well. So three or four times we went to film three or four of the episodes. There will be five episodes once they're all released. Um, and the last one being the event itself and the aftermath. What was it like seeing him in training and all of that? Well, it was a little surreal <clears throat> because some of my friends are, are into running and, and they knew who he was. And I, at first, I, well, a couple of years ago when we first started working with his sports management team, uh, I didn't really know who he was. But by the time we were filming for this documentary, we did. And it was, you know, he's, he's a fairly big deal. It was very interesting seeing how these elite athletes train. I mean, I'm sure they all don't train exactly the same way, but these guys were very, very rudimentary means. And they're, you know, they're running on mud tracks in Kenya and sleeping in these kind of dorm room type buildings. So they all um, living as a community of runners? Or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before seeing that, I had this image from one of those rocky movies where you have that Russian boxer who has all these team of scientists around him and he's hooked up to machines and they're measuring everything and things <laughs> yeah. like that. These guys, like Elliot, he pretty, well, he's, he's got a, a really good team and a coach and, and all that kind of stuff, but he does a lot of it himself. And, and a lot of, really? of his success, I think, comes from his attitude and his mindset. Because there's the physical challenge of running a marathon in, in that time. But there's the mental challenge as well, which is, you know, there's a huge amount of pressure on you to... Yeah, that's it, crazy. It's... Especially... And it's like, don't give up, don't give up. You've got... Yeah. Especially when you've got someone, like, making a documentary on how, how to do it. There's, all, you know, there's well, just there's, so much. There's, that's one small part yeah, of the there's, pressure. Yeah, there's, there's not just that. I mean, you know, yeah, we were making the documentary, but you know, it was just me and Dan, the photographer out there. So we were kind of like a fly on the wall. You know, he knew we were around, but he had a much, much wider goal uh, of, you know, he wanted to make history. He wanted to inspire people. He wanted, you know, there was a lot of press around it. There was all the sponsors at the event itself. And like the number of people involved in making this happen, it was in the, in the, in the hundreds, 
of people and the amount of funding that went into it. Yeah. You know, they they um, redid the entire tarmac of, of the um, circuit he was uh, running on in in um, in Vienna. Redid all the roads and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot that went into it. A lot of people involved. From what he told us in his interviews, for him. He really wanted to inspire people to show that you can overcome any limit and that, you know, no human is limited was his, his kind of slogan, motto, yeah. is his slogan. And everyone was very vocal about that. And he, you know, a lot of, a lot of PR went into spreading that message. So what happens if he fails? Like, oh, no human is limited, but I didn't manage to do it. You know, he so he tried like, one previously, though, and he... Yeah, he so this was a second he? time. Uh, the previous one was, it was a, called Breaking 2. This one is called the Ineos, Ineos 159 Challenge. The previous attempt was Breaking 2, but that was done with three different athletes. Okay. And so he wasn't alone doing that. So I think the pressure was kind of diluted. And it was also, you know, we're going to try and run two hours, but it wasn't well, everyone was said, you know, everyone was saying, oh, it's impossible for a human to run two, two hours. Mm -hmm. And then when Elliot did it in like, I think it was maybe a few seconds off, everyone sort of realized, oh, maybe, maybe this, this guy can do it. So this time around, it was like, there was a lot more expectations, Absolutely, whereas yeah. everyone before didn't really, you know, they were like, yeah, good luck. Was there any like particular moment that you can kind of take away from that or like, when, when you were like filming that you thought right this is really cool or like or, or not you just thought it was quite a challenging environment to film mm -hmm. or anything that you know that re you really took from it well first of all just you know being able to go to travel to kenya yeah for work yeah whatever the work is is kind of cool um to be able to travel out there to do the job that we do is really cool yeah to be able to see behind the scenes of what these, you know, incredible athletes are doing. Cause it's not only Elliot out there, there's a whole group of Olympic medalists. They're all really interesting and they're all really nice people. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting thing to film. I mean, not, not to, not to diss corporate videos, but it's slightly more interesting than filming of course. people in, in suits and ties in offices in central London. No, it's a completely but, different style of yeah, video. Yeah, I also enjoy doing the corporate stuff. Yeah, because that has its own sets of challenges. But as we've already discussed previously yes. in this podcast, yes, maybe within like filming, because I know that you know you had to get up at like three a.m. or whatever, four a.m. Oh yes, this is kind of what I'm trying to like get to get to get that to. time. The um, <laughs> yeah, my grumpy morning face in that <laughs> beat in behind the scenes video. Uh, yeah, there was that time we had. To, okay, we we would. There were very intense days because these runners, they wake up at the crack of dawn to go run. So we would finish filming at, well, by the time we got back to the hotel, uh, that I, you know, sort out the kit, clean the dust off the lenses, um, backed up memory cards, put all the batteries on to charge. Because yeah. I was out there alone, you know, I didn't have a, an AC or anyone. You'd get to bed around midnight. And then we'd be up at three or four in the morning to go and film Mad. film these guys. And at that time, the hotels have, aren't serving breakfast yet. <laughs> so you're up, you know, you're getting dragged out of bed at three or four in the morning, put in the back of a rattly old, what well, is a Kenyan version of a Jeep. <laughs> it's really cold because it's 2,800 uh, meters altitude. Um, so it is Kenya, but it's, it's, it's really cold in the morning. It gets warmer in the day, but you know, at, at four or five, six, even seven, it's quite cold. Yeah, true. You know, it's in the back of a Jeep that has no windows. It's like a pickup truck type of thing. Have a look at our Instagram and uh, scroll through. You'll or, find or it. Or even the behind the scenes video that you posted on Pro-AV. Uh, that that's a different thing. That was a previous project. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, similar. Similar, similar. Yeah, similar. 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 But on that one, I just had a mirrorless camera on a, on a handheld gimbal. Okay. And this one, I took the Kinefinity Terra 4K okay. on a Movie Pro with, a, with an easy rig and cinema lenses. No. So <laughs> it's quite a lot of kit to handle as a one-man band. Whereas, you know, a zoom lens on a mirrorless camera yes. on a Ronin S with autofocus is a lot easier. There are a few, uh, um, few videos and photos hanging about of me with a really grumpy face in the back of a Jeep in the morning, um, trying to rebalance a movie while we were still 
driving on really bumpy radley roads and freezing <laughs> and freezing cold with no breakfast but did, did i say job? did i say i didn't get breakfast did it, i didn't have breakfast i needed my food your fuel bars <laughs> <laughs> yeah i eventually got food after the run and then it was all right and then everything was was fine again and we got some really good shots yeah it was some of the best shots because we were trying to put the equivalent of uh, the full frame equivalent of a, a hundred mil lens on the movie pro it's so quite tight which is a bit of a challenge it's not like it's a wide angle and you can capture everything you need to aim it in the right direction no, you have to be focused um which is a general rule of filmmaking aim your camera in the right direction yeah. but um but also focus is quite difficult at, at those focal lengths wait is it, it's not manual focus is it it, it was manual focus oh, wow. okay. and I, I i didn't even at the time i didn't even have uh, a wireless system or a, 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 focus, a, puller, yeah. a focus pull thing um, now we have a, a little thumb controller to control the focus. On that one, I had to kind of reach around and, and <laughs> set it. the focus and then kind of hope that, yeah, or guess the focus. But you managed. That's the important thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really Especially. proud of some of those shots. They're, they're really good. And if people wanted to go and see that, they can go and see that in the documentaries on YouTube. Yes. So uh, if you search for Ineos 159 Challenge, on YouTube. I mean, I'm sure we can put some Clicks links in. links in the description of this video or something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, search for that on YouTube. Whenever we get approval, uh, we'll also have a kind of case studies page on our website right. yeah. uh, with some details about that shoot. I guess what we can kind of go on to now is like moving forward, what are your kind of ideal kind of clients that you want to be attracting? Or is there nothing too specific? There's nothing too specific. Um, as I said before, you know, I like Super Bowl commercials. Yeah. Uh, I like them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you um, one day want to do? Shoot a Super Bowl? Commercial? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, Could if I had to put, dream. if I had to set one one goal, that'd be it. I think. Really. But but you know, I'm not going to limit myself to that goal because no. there's lots of other things that I want to do and and. Um, you know where we want to. That's a very personal goal as well. Um, where, if if I'm speaking on behalf of Terralon, we have plenty of other goals as yes. well. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing too specific. That's a, a personal specific one because no, just because of the reasons we mentioned before. What would you say Terralon's goals then are in general? We want to uh, grow the company and our offering. So we'd like to to do more of the social media strategy um, and become, um, what's the word? A holistic, I think that's the word I was looking for, <laughs> holistic. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what it means. <laughs> oh. Well, it means, <laughs> it means you do Every, a bit of everything. Really. Yeah, kind of. All rounded. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't explained this very well, have we? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, put it this way. Um, we started out doing videos only yeah. or videos and photos and people would come to us and they'd say, Hey, I want to promote this. I want to make a three minute, three minute video. And we would, you know, at first we'd be like, okay, great. We'll make a three minute video for you. And we make this video and you know, they'd be happy, but it wouldn't really do very well. Or maybe it did, but they, it didn't really help their business purposes or whatever, because three minutes is a long time especially for to hold people's attention these for days ad, yeah for an ad is a long time so then we started saying hey why don't instead of a three minute video let's have a look at who your target audience is what platforms they're on and what content they are consuming on those platforms and we'll try and match your content to the content that these people want to see on those platforms instead of being a three minute ad that's just going to interrupt what they're there for because you know if you're watching tv you're watching a movie and then an ad comes on it's interrupting your experience and what what's the first thing you do you you switch off or you 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 go on your phone or you go and make yourself a cup of tea or whatever you want to do so we want to make content that these people actually want to see and that's and then we we started uh, all of the strategy around that and helping craft the right type of content before we actually even started filming or you know taking yeah. photos so we'd come back and we'd say all right instead of a three minute video we'll film a one minute video and a 30 second clip and then we'll make you know 50 we'll also give you 50 photos um and you know we have this whole 
whole campaign um, as opposed to this just one video. Yeah. Um, and after that, we, you know, as, as you know, we moved on to offering our social media subscription services where we not only do we do all of that, but we also take control of their social media accounts. We'll do a shoot day every month to create the content and then we'll trickle that out on their social media accounts for them yeah, and, the and you know manage their profiles curate the content or learn what content does the best tweak the next week's batch of content to fit what we've learned in the previous weeks and that kind of stuff so we've kind of evolved our offering and evolved the thinking behind the offering to provide extra layers of service we want to take that even further and you know make it even more of a smart solution for our clients. I'm not gonna go into the details of how we're gonna do that, but but we've got some plans. I think the general idea is, is, as you were saying from the beginning, it's like solving that problem that clients have initially. Our solution is digital and that, so it starts off with a video and it transfers on to like managing it. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of other things that you can do around that as mm-hmm. you grow, if you as you grow a team, mm-hmm. essentially. And I think that's probably one of your goals I assume as guys saying is to like grow a bigger team at Terra Ter- Ter- Long. Yeah, 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 no, we, we want to grow the team, we want to grow our offering, we want to provide more valuable service to our our um our clients. Yeah, I mean we just don't wanna don't want to be static. At what point do you think it's good to like move into an office? Because that's something obviously you've done very recently. Well it depends who you are, because if you're a freelancer there's I mean it, <laughs> If you're a freelancer and you want to move into a co-working space, there's definitely a lot of advantages there because you can, well, first you can have a work-life separation and you can also do a lot of networking and, and, and meet people in that working space. And it's also nice to have some human interaction because, you know, when you're a freelancer, you get a bit lonely. You get a bit lonely. If you're trying to grow a business, well, we, we the, re- okay, the reasons we moved into an office are obviously the reasons that I've just said, work-life separation. We needed a bit more space to put all our gear. But... The main reason is that we realized that we wanted to scale our our company and eventually hire more people. And you can't hire people if you don't if you're working from your bedroom. If you're bringing on an intern or something, it's like, oh yeah, um, let's sit at my desk and my bed's right there. Yeah. It's a bit, bit bit weird. So we knew that it was a step that we had to take in order to grow and in order to be able to hire more people. So you eventually. probably had it in the back of your mind for a while that that's eventually. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we wanted to move into offices like very early on. Yeah. <laughs> At what point did it make it the right decision? Well, that you felt it was the right decision to do that when we were financially able to do so, because it's a you know, it's a very big overhead. Yeah, and like, how much do you think relatively do you need to like have saved up? Maybe compare compared to like how much rent you think. Uh, that depends on you know how much work you might have that year so obviously it's a bit of a risk it's like it's like i guess the next step from i guess the first one was just moving out mm-hmm. from your parents house and it's kind of a similar sort of mm-hmm. jump it's like how much yeah of your, so we we, we the reason we were financially able to move into an office is because we'd started our social media subscriptions and their year-long contracts i mean you know clients can cancel and, and opt out at any point but we also trusted ourselves to keep them. not get yeah to, <laughs> to not get to that point. So we had a couple of people sign up for a year, and so we knew we were going to have you know x amount of income per month for that at least that year. Okay. So this place is it's a, a two year contract, a two year term. So we took a bit of a risk in that you know we were. Hopefully okay for one year, but we didn't know what the next year was going to be like. So you just you just think it was a risk you had to kind of take to like keep moving forward and not stagnate essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. It's definitely there's, there's definitely some sort of risk involved. But if you want to scale, then you it's kind of like dress. What's the what's the saying? Dress for the work you want, or dress <laughs> dress for the job you want. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what we did here. Similar similar yeah. sort of thing, and yeah. it's kind of keep pushing you across those boundaries mm-hmm. is it time for the instagram questions I th- well i can have a quick look and see if there's anything how many have we got is my mom we most have, likely we have, we have we have a few we have, we a, have few. a few we have a few people who've interacted oh, hooray how exciting <laughs> but while you're looking at them should we shall i plug do a shameless plug for our, our instagram accounts yeah go for it so follow follow terralon media 
It's at Terralon Media on Instagram. Wow. Amazing. There you go. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it then. Uh, let's, I think, yeah, we, I think we've covered quite a lot of things here and uh, yeah. it's, been, it's been good fun. I think we can... We can let's end with the Instagram questions. Sure. KingleGend757 has said Canon or Nikon? Canon. Well, have? I've probably taken a, a total of five photos on a Nikon. Yeah. On my uncle's Nikon. Nikon? Nikon? Whatever. Nikon. I've used Canon a lot, so... You don't have much to compare. Yeah, and also, well, I don't really know what what Nikon do these days for video, but certainly Canon have more of a reputation for being better at video. And it's Canon's what you started on, and yeah, there's a bit of nostalgia there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's good for that. Sam Beb says, "Who's better, Tom or Sam?" <laughs> <laughs> so, for a bit of context, do you want to explain who uh, Sam is? <laughs> Sam is our DP slash camera operator on a big job we're doing this year, and Tom is the photographer uh, on this very same job. He's, he's put you on the spot there, hasn't he, Julian? <laughs> uh, well, you know, you can't have favourites. Um, I, I love my my two uh, children, children <laughs> <laughs> equally. <laughs> oh, um, very diplomatic. Yes. There you go. I'll, I'll stay at that. You'll leave it there. Yeah. Oh, damn, we got spammers going, do good and, and good will follow, okay. Do what? I thought it says, do good and good will follow. Oh, inspirational quote. Inspirational Great. quote. Great, that's not a question, but, you know, why not? We have a question from uh, Guy V. Ellis. Oh, I wonder who he is. It's yeah. a weird Instagram handle. Yeah, weird Instagram handle. I'm a stalker. Why are you so beautiful? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I don't really know what to say. I'm, I feel quite flustered. <laughs> my guy, you stopped me these tracks. Uh, no, no answer. No, no, no answer. Just, you know, it's effortless, I guess. Effortless. effortless. Oh, fair enough. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, oh, that's what wow. I say. And Guy has beautiful eyes. Oh. So he go. thinks I'm beautiful. Wake Fred up, as we all know, is now Freddie's, our oh, editor's new handle. So is it, this is just Terrellon Media asking <laughs> asking questions. Have you sent some questions as well, Sanity? Uh, Wait, I'm going to send one in as well. <laughs> the question. Well, Freddie's is, who's your favourite brother? Well, Freddy, because he's yeah, my only brother. He wanted that, didn't he? Yeah, he really yeah. wanted that. Freddy, you're my favourite brother. Well done. So You had a lot of competition there. <laughs> E.G. Bowless, that's Grace. So yep. we work with at Square Mile Sports. Yep. And the Bloomberg Square Mile Relay. She goes, what's your favourite relay city and why? Uh, so maybe some context. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so context, yeah. for the past year, and we're starting the second year, we've been filming... Uh, the Square Mile Relay Races, uh, or I should say the Bloomberg Square Mile Relay Races, because... Sponsored by Bloomberg. Yeah. It's a corporate running event, and it's a team bonding thing for a lot of large companies send teams of, of 10, and they run a race, and then there's music and food, and it's, you know, just a nice day out for any, everyone. There's a charity purpose yeah. to it as well. Yeah, yeah, and there's a big charity charity side to it, raise money for various causes. They have a race in lots of different cities around the world. Yeah. Which yes, let, me get, let me get the map. Go on. He's obviously very excited about it, so we'll allow him to grab his map. Oh, hush you. <laughs> so. There you the go. Map. Here's the map. Yeah, there you, you can see everything there. Uh, well, these aren't all races, but anyway, they cover a lot of that. So there's uh, New York, San Francisco, Sao Paulo, uh, and a whole bunch of other ones. Um, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So that map's basically um, where we've traveled as a company the the, this like is uh, I mean we're kind of going on a tangent a here bit. but these so are all of the cities that we've done jobs in um, we should probably actually add a few now but anyway but a big part of that. that is through the square mile relay essentially yeah quite a large part um, so let's answer Grace's question well, we've just done Dubai. I quite like Dubai because yeah. it's the opening race of the season. It's always like very exciting to start off the year. Uh, sure, I enjoyed because so we all went out yeah, as a team yeah, yeah. for the first time. Yeah, that was fun. I also enjoyed San Francisco. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed Sydney. Those because they're really cool cities and places she wants to be in. One answer. Oh my god! <laughs> You've got to put it down to one and why. All right. Um, That's a specific one. Paris. Paris. I like Paris. Is there one in Paris? Oh yeah, but they don't do it anymore. 
Well, they never did. It got cancelled because not enough people signed up. <laughs> you can't choose Paris. Well, it's going to antagonise Greece. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult because you have to weigh up like the cities and the race. Yeah. So let's go with Sydney. Sure. Because it was a pretty good race and and it's also a cool city. No, I guess. And we're lucky to be able to travel out there yeah, for work. Which so as far away as yeah. possibly go. Yeah. I guess also because you, I think the guy said this before uh, to me that because it's so far out, it means that you you know to make the trip a little bit worthwhile that you have to spend a little bit more time there to kind of enjoy the city as well. Is that do you think that's yeah? Kind but of you can do that anywhere. I guess you can do that. You know, I spent a few extra days in in Dubai visiting friends on the tail end of 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 course you did of that one. <laughs> So, but well, anyway, yeah, Paris, final answer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think that's, that kind of sums us up for today then. Yeah. Uh, is that, other, is that all we have time for question wise? Yeah. That's I, was like, oh, no, I know there's like th- loads and loads more questions that, yeah. that people have asked, but um, we don't have time for the others. We don't have time for the others, unfortunately. Um, um, yeah, no, that's been really good fun. Um, if you want to kind of follow us on our other social media channels he's already tagged the Instagram Terrell on Media and then Facebook LinkedIn is uh, something we're doing as well um, YouTube we're doing a little bit of um, yeah well this podcast is going to be on YouTube YouTube yeah so you right well, if, you, if you're listening to it on Spotify or whatever, wherever else um, then you can also it. watch it on and sit through it again yeah, <laughs> on YouTube and we're going to continue to do these um, I think probably Freddie Freddie next. Freddie next. We'll get Freddie on. How that. are you going to do yourself? You're just going to sit here by yourself and I'm interview yourself. I'm going to sit here by myself. And, uh, <laughs> I have think. A great I time. think. I think for that one guy and I will have to team up and. Oh, and, and I'm going to be <laughs> interrogated by you. Too. I'm going to yeah, be sitting yeah. here scared. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. No. But we'll have guests as well. Guests and also yeah. we're thinking of covering more kind of topics, certain topics as a team, sitting yeah. around the table, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. So subscribe and leave a review. Yeah, get some Great. reviews in if you if you enjoyed it, found some value, and uh, thank you, Julian. For You're welcome. Down on my interrogation. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, did the audio work this time? I believe so. Okay. Otherwise, yeah, <laughs> no, that was good fun. Nice to have it all with the proper setup as yeah, well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, looking forward to more. Right then, as am I. Over and out. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Awesome. <laughs> I hope that worked. <laughs> Me too. No, that was good. Is this reality or am I pretending? That was poetry, huh? <laughs>